So, John, who would win in the fight between George Bailey and his little brother? Well, the little brother was in the army, but I'm mm. going to plead the third and say Mary would win. <laughs> the scene where she threw the baseball through the window, she had a hell of an arm on her, so I think she would win. Uh, fine, fine, sure. Some films are fine, just the way they are. Welcome everybody to Beyond the Box Set, a podcast where we pitch prequels, sequels and spin-offs to films that don't have any. I'm Harry and joining me as always is John. Hello. And a guest this week, our first ever returning guest, Ross Burton. Hello everybody. We finally went out of friends, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we're recycling through the <laughs> We've yeah. circled back round. <laughs> now before we start talking about It's a Wonderful Life which is the start of our Christmas season. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, Ross. Merry Christmas, John. Can I tell the listeners what date it is? No. Okay. No, never tell them. <laughs> Don't John, look behind you, the curtain. John, I've got you a Christmas present. Oh, really? Oh, bless you. Close your eyes, hold it in hands. I'm scared. It should be. Not great for an audio format, but I'm still excited. <laughs> it's, good, it's, good, it's fine. What is it? May Handicraft. Coasters! Oh, <laughs> thank you, Harry. Uh, <laughs> listeners, if you're wondering, we've just been using woolly gloves for coasters whenever we're drinking while recording, which all works well, but uh, sometimes you put your drink down on a thumb and then your drink nearly falls over. Also, it's getting cold now because it's Christmas and John might want to use I, his I, gloves. I need my gloves, yeah. So uh, now we oh, have thank you, uh, Harry. coasters. I'm weirdly touched for such a cheap gift. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm driving, so I don't even get a beer. Do you um, get a coaster, though? I do get a coaster. A bit of glove on it. <laughs> I have touched. <laughs> Lovely. All right, well, who chose this film? It was I you, did. wasn't it? It was my fault. <clears throat> Actually, this is a really good film. Yeah. Harry and John invited me to uh, come back on the podcast again. Thank you very much for having me, guys. And said, pick a Christmas film. And I picked a Christmas film I had never seen, but I was under the impression everybody should see. Mm-hmm. I was not disappointed. Quite often you get these, you know, 100 films to see before you die things, and they always include Citizen Kane, which is only okay. But It's a Wonderful Life really is worth watching. It Mm -hmm. really is an amazing film for a lot of reasons. And I was really chuffed with watching it, and I very much enjoyed it. So yeah, this was the Christmas film that was my go-to, must be watched. And I hadn't seen it yet, so I thought it would be a good one. Well, it was a really good choice, and glad you chose it, because I'd seen this once before, and I'd forgotten how brilliant a movie this is mm. and it's got to be one of my favourite movies yeah it's up now, there with, with that's, that's my favourite that's what, so what I'm saying now I mean I'd, I'd forgotten this after last time I watched it but yeah. yeah and it definitely has a lot of moments in it which old movies tend to have especially the big ones where you think oh that looks kind of derivative I've seen that a hundred times before oh wait it's not derivative that's just where it started that's mm. the first yeah. time anyone's <laughs> ever gone to a graveyard and gone no no <laughs> um <laughs> In an alternate timeline where someone's died and they didn't in the other timeline. I think a Christmas Carol might have that scene beat, but there are other things. Like... Yes, possibly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's been parodied and redone so many times in so mm. many ways. I mean, Back to the Future 2 is practically It's a Wonderful Life. Mm. I hadn't noticed that until I watched this film. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Tannen, like Biff Tannen's Tannen Town and stuff, when uh, oh, Marty's God, yeah. running through and like he finds his dad's grave and stuff. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking in It's a Wonderful Life, oh, this has totally been ripped off from Back to the Future. Wait a minute. No, it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is about 30 years earlier. Yeah. Did you find it to be a particularly festive movie? Because no. it is the Christmas classic, right? Yeah, well, it is a little bit, but it's not sort of whack you over the head with how Christmassy it is. Yeah. I mean, the big thing in It's a Wonderful Life is obviously the angel arrives and shows him what life would be like if he hadn't been born. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the whole film. Mm-hmm. That's the last 15 minutes of the film. Yeah, I remember that being the whole film. <laughs> I did not realise that. I was completely shocked. I was and weirdly for, for an old film, this is over two hours. Yeah, mm. I was sat for an hour and a half wondering when the angel was going to turn up. Yeah, and is, that's how the film opens. Yeah. It's with a it hilarious so. conversation amongst the galaxies. Oh. I like how each angel is just a galaxy that just sort of lights up as they speak. That was good. And then Clarence <laughs> sort of scoots in from the side. Yeah. I very much enjoyed that. Yeah, very whimsical. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the actual stuff that happens around Christmas is the him falling in the river, Clarence finds him, and the whole alternate reality he explores mm-hmm. all happen late Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. But the entire rest of the film is his whole life, mm-hmm. none of which happens at Christmas. Yay! Hello, Bedford Park! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas George! 
Christmas Emporium! Merry Christmas, you wonderful building alone! Well, John, you've not said much about this. What's your take on this film? Um, seen it before? Yes, I have. I've seen, it's one of those films I've not actively watched before. I've just kind of been at home at Christmas in a pleasant food coma. And mm-hmm. it's been just, on. You put, it, yeah, you put it on and it's just on and then you kind of half watch it and it's nice and... Mm. Yeah, it's it is a it is a good film. The ending is very abrupt. You have got an hour and a half of just the life and times of George Bailey. Yeah, Which and was then still you... entertaining. I, I, I didn't think it was. It was slow very Citizen Kane in that mm. respect. I'm bringing Citizen Kane back up, but yeah, I, I thought it was telling a story similar to Citizen Kane's. His mm-hmm. life, his loves, his work and university and failures to go to university and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But much more intriguingly, mm. and I like that. Yeah, like the framing device of the angel occasionally dropping in as a narrator was kind of cool, but otherwise it was mostly just a good straight-up story. You could cut the angel stuff from the end, and it'd just be a really good biopic of George Bailey. Mm-hmm. Pretty depressing one. <laughs> yeah, man he ha- just dies at the end. <laughs> not, not even that, but just man has dreams thwarted at every turn. Well, that, and, uh, yeah. ultimately, <laughs> it's know. a disappointing life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's an edit we could do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a disappointing life. Oh, yeah. dear. Well, this is my thought, because he goes. Through, George Bailey goes through this whole film, you see him go through this life, and he's, at every turn he's like, I'm, I'm going to leave now, I'm going to leave now, I'm going to leave and go on this adventure. Mm-hmm. And every turn, the town pulls him back. Mm-hmm. And he constantly says throughout the film, oh, I hate this town, this town is so boring, I can't imagine being stuck in this one-horse town forever, being stuck in a boring desk job, which is essentially mm-hmm. what he has. Mm-hmm. And then, to the point where the film culminates in him, you know, becoming genuinely suicidal, but even before that, being kind of a dick to his wife and kids. I mean, that the mitigating circumstances, but still. Oh, yeah, I, I get I it, I get it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then it ends and he's, still stuck in that town but oh everyone's giving him money he's not going to go to jail anymore so it's cool I found myself thinking a lot about like the morning after <laughs> well, the, the morning after the film ends yeah or just like what's going to happen to after that yeah. Just, yeah I still haven't solved the problem that I'm frustrated in my own town kind of yeah, yeah kind although of. I, I wonder if maybe that's the point of the film though mm. as in he needed to get right to the bottom of the barrel mm-hmm. in order to be reminded of the fact that it's a wonderful life and he is incredibly rich Oh, yeah, totally. I, that someone actually toasted to him, to George Bailey, the richest man in town. He has got these loyal friends. He's got four kids. He's got an amazing wife. He's got a pr- pretty secure, decent job going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not pretty like secure. He... <laughs> yeah, I have some questions that's... about that business. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's actually, that's... not secure. Dick's <laughs> the, the least, secure part. least secure. Forget that I said secure. That's, that's, um, that's a plot point for like three times in the film. Good point. Okay, <laughs> uh, I was rambling there slightly, but he's got friends. He's got kids. He's got a wife. He's got a good life Mm. lots of people would probably enjoy a life like Mm -hmm. that if they could trade their own life for that one they might and i think that that's what the film ends on kind of be thankful for the great stuff you've got and if life hasn't necessarily gone the way you planned that's not terrible necessarily Mm. you might still have a wonderful life Oh, I 100% agree. And that is that is the genius of this film, because I do think it's a great film, don't get me wrong. Because that is what it does. It puts into this kind of sense of what is a life built on, and, and then it has this really lovely message of it being about, you know, the, the relationships you build and what you add to it. And that's the whole thing. So the, the, the thing everyone remembers about this film is the conceit of him being lifted out of his own life and seeing what the world, would have, his town would have looked like had he not been around. And I think that's something that plays into something we all think, because we all probably have those thoughts occasionally of like, yeah. what, are we, what are we contributing to the world? What would our friends and our family be like if we weren't yeah. part of that world? So, and so I think that's a very human, it tells a very human story and it's really interesting and that's why it's been recycled so many times. Yeah, and I, I loved it. I, mm. I also like the fact that the build-up isn't just setting things up so that we can take them out later to see what it would be like without him. Mm-hmm. It was a story by itself. Totally, it wasn't yeah. just build up to a punch at the end. It was in itself very good. And like I said, you could cut the last half hour of the film mm-hmm. and it would still be a really good film. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think one of the problems I had that left me a little bit unsettled was that, well, there's a couple of things. One was that when he has his suicide attempt and then Clarence takes him, takes him to an alternate yeah. universe, it's like, oh, but look at what life would be like if you hadn't lived. And then Bedford Falls has become Pottersville. Yeah. And it's supposed to be horrifying, but actually Pottersville seems kind of great. Right. All the strip clubs. <laughs> it looks fun. It's like a thriving nightlife. The bars are packed. You know, People are... keep punching each other and the cops are really violent. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's perfect, <laughs> but you know, it's just, that's just leads on a Friday Spades, night, isn't, isn't it? it? Like, <laughs> also, I want to question some of the technicalities of if he'd never lived. Mm-hmm. So his little brother was still born. Yeah. Because they said that, oh yeah, he died in the ice and so yes. never went to war and saved all those people. Mm-hmm. So... It's a thing where George Bailey was never born, but his little brother still was. So his little brother is then the oldest. And yeah. yeah, if he was the oldest little brother, lovely. he might have behaved differently. If mm-hmm. he was an only child, he might have behaved differently. Might not have fallen down the ice in the first place. Mm. Yeah, that's what I thought. Surely, 
it's like the butterfly flapping its wings in China, causing a tsunami in somewhere else. I don't yeah, know. it's like that's it's that, that scenario where if Georgia never existed, would they have been playing the same game at the exact same moment from to fall into the ice? But well, actually, do you remember that George <clears throat> kind of bullied his brother or like encouraged his brother into taking that yeah he did. ride on the shovel anyway? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe if he hadn't been there, his brother would have actually wussed out and not had the courage to take the slide therefore wouldn't have fallen in the ice in the first place and mm-hmm. therefore still wouldn't have died yeah also George being around didn't necessarily help everyone what about poor Nick the bartender in the real universe he, he doesn't get to own his own bar like, in the, <laughs> alternate, so, universe. Yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. alternate universe he's great he's on his own bar he's quippy and quirky he's got a good sense of humour you know I thought yeah. he was great double bourbon will you quick huh okay what's yours I was just thinking, uh, it's been so long since I... <laughs> Look, mister, I'm standing here waiting for you to make up your mind. That's a good man. I was just thinking uh, of a flaming rum punch. Uh, no, it's not cold enough for that. Not nearly cold enough. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Just got I got it. Mulled wine, heavy on the cinnamon and light on the cloves. Oh, wait, give me light and be lively. Hey, look, mister. We save hard drinks in here for men who want to get drunk fast, and we don't need any characters around to give the joint atmosphere. Is that clear? Or do I have to slip you my lift for a convincer? What's he talking about? Oh, Nick, 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 yeah. Just give him the same as mine. He's okay. Okay. <laughs> also, done in Back to the Future 3. Mm. In here, we pour whiskey. Yeah. And then he pours it, and it spills out and mm. starts eating the bar. <laughs> there are so many archetypes in this film. Because, oh, yeah. I mean... Mr. Potter is Mr. Burns. Yes. Like, there's no two ways about oh, it. God, that, yeah. That is just pure Mr. Burns. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> also, I like that he was called Henry Potter. Yeah. Henry is shortened for Harry. Yeah, so close. So close. Shortened yeah. to Harry. <laughs> it's true. But yeah, I did think that as much as... And I'm, 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 a, I'm a cynical person. I, I, I do have to preface this by saying I think this film is amazing and it's a classic for a reason. But yeah, I did feel like there was something very kind of almost aggressively all-American kind of small C conservative about it. Like mm. the sense that what is good is what is very pure and heteronormative and, you know, a wife and four kids and everyone behaves themselves. And Christianity. Christianity, exactly. You know, <laughs> in the alternate universe, my favourite character, Slutty Slutty Violet. <laughs> um, Slutty Violet, yeah. <laughs> in the, in the alternate alternate you know, reality Violet. Yeah, she, yeah. She just becomes like a drunken prostitute, we, we assume. Like, Certainly mm. she was a lot more sexually liberated in the alternate universe and mm. in... The mid 1940s, women becoming sexually liberated is considered evil and terrible and bad alternate universe. Whereas, yeah. actually, probably okay if women are sort of in charge of their own sexuality. Yeah, I found her character puzzling. Yeah. I, I did. I love the fact that she had hats for days. Oh. <laughs> That's true. She had a new hat in every scene. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Also, poor Mary in the alternate universe. Apparently, if she doesn't meet that one guy, she's going to become a short-sighted spinster. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and lose her fashion sense yeah. and become a librarian. Yeah, like this smart, intelligent, this smart, attractive woman who's been away to New York for university. Apparently, without George around, she's just going to be just... a librarian. Yes, and it paints librarian as like a really shit job as mm. well. Oh yeah, don't die, George. Your wife will become literate. <laughs> <laughs> a woman will become literate. Good point. Good point. They're right in the idea that women reading books is bad. Oh yeah. god. Oh, it's a sexist life. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, that was another thing because that I had with this was that there's something about Mary. I just didn't trust. Mm. I don't know. How yeah. did you feel about Mary and the whole... The I also romance? think there's something about Mary, but that's a different film. That is a different like. film. Yeah, I, I like Mary. I did think she was very violent towards vinyl records. Like, you don't... Yeah. There was that one scene where she basically brings George over to try and seduce him and it totally oh, yes. fails. And she just smashes her vinyl record on the side <laughs> of the player. Like, oh, come on. Those things are nice. I think, again, it's watching films from the perspective of all the films that have kind of referenced this film. But there was something about Mary. I, I, I can't stop saying that. Like, there was something about Mary's character that I found deeply sinister and untrustworthy. And I was like, what's your game? What, what angle are you playing? She was here, seducing him initially, wasn't she? She was, she was. And, but it was, it was more the fact that I felt like she was almost she was too nice. It was like, she was so nice that I thought, you know mm. what, you've got issues and secrets and all kinds of things going on. Like, what did she get up to in New York? What did she? What, what was she doing when he wasn't on screen, just generally? And also, when there's the scene where they're throwing stones at the old man's... Yeah, how man. come she's got a, such a phenomenally good rock-throwing arm? Well, there's that also. But then she's like, he makes a wish to go around the world and see the world and have adventures. And she throws hers, and he's like, what's your wish? She's like... Not telling. It's like, you know her wish was, I hope all his dreams fail. Yeah. <laughs> Stop with me. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. She actually reveals that later. Yeah. That her wish was for their home together and mm. stuff. 
Ooh, good point. Mary is evil. Mary <laughs> is a bit iffy in this film. Maybe she's magic. Maybe, yeah. But then maybe only magic is possible if you're an angel. Yeah. Maybe she's an angel. Maybe she died. Maybe she's the devil. Oh. Mm. What'd you wish, George? Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full. Mary, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and next year and a year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. And then I'm going to build things. I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers a hundred stories high. I'm going to build bridges a mile long. Were well, you going to throw a rock? Hey, that's pretty good. What'd you wish, Mary? Oh, no, there's that scene that I found quite funny with the kids who were so obnoxious, so obnoxious, um, <laughs> where he comes in and he's drunk and he's ranting and raving. And oh, like, yeah, and he one yells was at like, Yeah, one was like, why, daddy, why? And then he storms <laughs> off. And then one, I think the little boy or the little girl goes, should we pray for daddy? And she goes, yes, pray for him, pray for him hard. It's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, Cristiano normative. It was very churchy parts of this film yeah. but, I mean it did have angels in as one of the principal characters true well yeah <laughs> it is that's what I mean it's, it's positing this kind of very all American like I say it's like what yeah. is the American dream and the American dream is a house with a wife and three, three or four children with strange names <laughs> and uh, Zuzu. Zuzu. Zuzu yeah and it's like the outside world is the enemy kind of thing so mm-hmm. it's a good point and you but know sexual stick, liberation is the enemy stick it to the man though stick it to the man mm. we don't like that yeah we don't of... like big business yeah, yeah. Which is another thing I thought about this film, which is that you know, Mr. Foster is a bad guy. I, I wasn't sympathising with him particularly. But I do feel like Bailey Brothers' bombs kind of deserve to fail. Why? It felt like a reckless and unsustainable business plan. Unsustainable in what sense? Well, as you said yourself, it comes like three or four times where it like comes to the brink of collapse. Mm-hmm. And his solution to it not collapsing is to give away his own money in unsecured loans to the citizens of Bedford. Mm-hmm. And that's really unsustainable and dangerous. It's true. Yeah, but in that situation, it was either that or bow to the big business. True. And but, close up. Mm-hmm. But, and, and that wasn't anything that they did wrong. That was just because there was a run on the bank and that's what happens, I guess. And because they weren't such a big business, they didn't have the freedom to just for, for it not to be a problem. Mm-hmm. That's just a problem with them being a small yeah, business. Yeah, you fixed later, the crisis, that's it. Later, when that guy loses the money, well... That's just because he's they, shit. They probably should have thought of what if what if that were to happen. Yeah. Rather than just be like, shit, that's happened, we're all going to jail because somebody made an honest mistake. Yeah. Uncle Billy, Uncle, is it Uncle Billy? Uncle Billy should not be. He should definitely have been sacked a long time ago. Yeah, he needs to be part of the pasture. He is not capable of running that business. Also, where did that raven come from? Yeah, that's it. He's letting... Why was there a yeah. raven in the bank? <laughs> he's clearly in the grip of senile dementia. Like, he's, he's, he's letting this office be overrun by rancid animals. <laughs> <laughs> from the very beginning, he had yeah. uh, things. He had strings on his finger to remind him of stuff. And I then he the got bit. older as it went on, it got worse. Oh, I loved the bit where he was just really sad and he just went sort of slumped in his office chair, looking really sad. And then a squirrel came and gave him a hug. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like the that raven. Was great. Was it Doctor Doolittle? Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Like when it was the raven, I was like, okay, it's a little bit unhygienic, but I'll uh-huh. get with it. Fine. Yeah, but yeah. then when there's a squirrel, I was like, this place is infested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's not running a, a healthy business. Or is there something to do with ravens in banks? Like, there needs to be a raven in a bank. Well, the thing is, the raven is the ancient symbol of death. So I just feel like it's the symbol that this business is doomed. <laughs> yeah, that's your point. But also, it's not a bank. Yeah. A loan company. Kind yeah, of. loan and building. Yeah, yeah, building society. Again, which I felt like, okay, so the bank is bad, but actually offering loans to people who can't afford to pay those loans back is mm. also very shady business practicing. Yeah, that's, like, that's yeah. payday loans. It is. It's, it's, I'll pay you, I'll give you this money today. There's no paper trail, but you will give it back to me. <laughs> or I'll break your legs. Oh, yeah. We'll send a raven around. <laughs> I have some news for you, folks. I was just talking to old man Potter, and he's guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank's going to reopen next week. But, George, I got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, Charlie. I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. And I'll take mine now. No, but you're... You're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a hundred others. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get your money in 60 days. For 60 days? Well, now that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live in 
until the bank opens. I got back the bills to pay. Any other thoughts? No. Uh, so do you have any drinking games prepared? Uh, I had a couple. Uh, oh. Drink along with them is definitely an option. Oh yeah, some good uh, bar scenes in the second half. There's a lot yeah, of drinking. Scenes, yes. Every time someone loses money, they start drinking. <laughs> Every time something bad happens, they seem to start drinking. Hip flasks just pop out of nowhere, I think. <laughs> Several times. So drink along with it would work. But I also think every time someone says the word swell. Swell, oh, okay. Every, every time somebody says the word C. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> good. Wait, it's like a full stop for them. Yeah. That's true. I mean, with swell as well, I think it should be one drink for a swell, two drinks if George says swell, and three mm. drinks if George says, that's swell, Mary. Because <laughs> <laughs> he says, that's swell, Mary, a whole bunch. Mm, mm-hmm. Even for things that aren't really very swell at all. No. So... Sometimes it's an aggressive swell. Yeah. Oh, an extra point if it's used sarcastically. An extra yeah, drink. So if it's a that swell Mary said by George sarcastically, it's four drinks. Mm-hmm. I could get you wrecked pretty quick. That's, yeah, oh, that's good. Get I, through I the eggnog. Was, yeah, absolutely. You got any, Harry? Drunk whenever George does something unbelievably cool. The main example I can think of, there was one moment where he just sort of reached behind him and just lit a match off the ground lit the cigar or something that was in his mouth and just threw the match to the side like he was Michael Jackson throwing his hand. Oh, yeah, it was all one move. And then just sort of walked off like with his hands in his pockets looking like Michael Jackson going forwards, I guess. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Do you specifically watch films for people lighting matches in interesting ways? Because you brought that up during Frankenstein too. I think it's just a thing of old films. Like you said, it's a thing of old matches. That's true. Old matches can be lit easier than modern ones. Uh, That's what the majority of westerns are predicated on yeah, yeah there was a point in, in, in Frankenstein cool just then where somebody seemingly without moving it was so weird they lit it off the bottom of their shoe but they did it so quickly and so slickly mm. oh, I yeah. barely saw it happen this was a grave digger who didn't get a name yeah <laughs> or a line mm. and was wearing a full suit mm. yeah digging graves at night with a full suit I actually didn't... that's the point drink for whenever somebody does something in its, its wonderful life that you shouldn't really do in a suit Okay. Like jump in a swimming pool. Jump in a swimming pool. Be... Oh God, that's one scene that would get you really drunk right off the bat. Yeah, I had questions about that scene. Because <laughs> on what planet would a bunch of... The women particularly, like the men, okay, for they're in suits. But the women who have like spent all evening getting themselves beautified, put a dress on, <laughs> yeah. put makeup on. And then like the pool opens up, George and Mary fall in. So observant, like seriously. Yeah. And then everyone else is like, whippy! And they all just jump in. Like there's going to be boobs everywhere. Like yeah. those women are going to be so exposed. Yeah. Like it's going to be boobs everywhere. Yeah. But also, like it was a, it was a big drop down to the pool. Yeah. There was seemingly no way out unless the floor is completely taken out, which means that everybody's got to go in. Yeah. It was uh, the mechanics uh, of that scene weren't fully established. Yeah, I would like to see that scene go on for the next half hour. <laughs> I also had a lot of questions about the character who I think this is one scene in the entire film. So Mary is being hit on by some guy who she's not interested in, mm-hmm. and then George kind of sweeps in and steals her, and he's like, "Gosh darn it!" And then he's like standing by the switch, and then this like devil on his shoulder pops up and goes, "You know, the dance floor is built right over a swimming pool, and you also know that the button is right there." And you also know that George and Mary are dancing on the crack right now. Yeah. It's like if <laughs> and Clarence... I've got the key. Yeah, and I've got the key. What's the matter, a fellow? Jealous? Did you know there's a swimming pool under this floor? And did you know that button behind you causes this floor to open up? And did you further know that George Bailey is dancing right over that crack? I've got the key. He is totally like the devil to Clarence's angel. Like he is just going around <laughs> telling people to do all oh the my bad God, that, things. That's another <clears throat> brilliant sequel idea. I yeah. wonder if any did either of you guys write that? No, uh, we've, but, we've come up with so much this week. The story following that guy mm. and how he's influenced loads of other things mm. and ruined everybody's life. <laughs> and that's the one bit we see mm. in It's a Wonderful Life. But the sequel shows it like Back to the Future Two style, mm. layered on top of the original. Oh, mm. you could do it like. What if he tries to commit suicide at the end and the angel comes down and says, wait, but if you commit suicide, then... They never would have fallen in that pool. What about all these bad things that would never have happened? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But in the end, though, they fell in the pool and that was part of what cemented their relationship. True, Um, true. Maybe he was an angel. Um, Maybe he does commit suicide later and uh, Clarence comes to him too and says, look at all the wonderful things you did in your life. Okay, there was just that key thing and... (laughs) It wasn't that wonderful, but... Wasn't that wonderful? So really, it was just accident. Never mind. You can just you can just kill yourself. <laughs> and that's why he didn't get his wings the last time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a trail of dead bodies of, of like successful suicide attempts behind Clarence. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> that's another sequel. 
You sent for me, sir? Yes, Clarence. A man down on Earth needs our help. Splendid. Is he sick? No, worse. He's discouraged. At exactly 10.45 p.m. Earth time, that man will be thinking seriously of throwing away God's greatest gift. Oh, dear, dear, his life. Then I've only an hour to dress. Drink for sexual harassment. There's a lot of it in this film. Standard, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is Not the standard, standard, what we're talking about. No. Standard for a film <laughs> from this era, possibly. Yeah. Mm. There is a scene early on where they're in the Bailey household and Annie, the obligatory 50s, mildly sassy black maid. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the is only that... black woman in America at the time. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know, she's serving them food and, you know, doing a job. And then... The younger brother Harry comes in and he got like harassing her and chasing her, oh, right, yeah. and he just slaps her on the bum. Oh, yeah, God, it's like wow, you yeah that boundaries was... and boundaries. I Harry. mean, may, maybe it's been established. Uh, maybe it's been established that she consented to that in advance. I I, no, like I, power... I refuse to apologize for that. I thought like there's an inherent power dynamic going on there. That I she's refuse to apologize for that. Yes, he that was scummy. Yeah, was exactly. Yeah, to do. Ex- absolutely. Poor Annie. Yeah. Aren't you going to finish dressing for your graduating party? Look at you. I don't care. It's George <gasps> Tucks. Annie, my sweet, if you got those pies. You lay a hand on me, I'll hit you with this broom. Annie, I'm in love with you. There's a moon out tonight. <laughs> Um, so that happens. There's, there's a scene between Mary and George when they're kind of outside and when she loses her clothes. That scene happens. But before right. she loses her clothes, I think, or well, maybe after, they're talking to each other about something. And there's this pervert is sat on the porch who's watching them the whole time oh yeah and then you two goes, should kiss yeah just kiss them. I was like god put your dick away man like, <laughs> <laughs> I really yeah, thought you one... might start masturbating at any moment <laughs> am I talking too much yes why don't you kiss her instead of talking at her death how's that why don't you kiss her instead of talking at her death want me to kiss her huh oh youth is wasted on the wrong people and then Violet just gets objectified by everyone that's true like she gets slut shamed when she's eight (laughs) (laughs) the scene in the um, in the uh, chemist slash ice cream bar which I don't understand I don't Um, don't understand that either yeah where she comes in with her hair and all the bows and she's like I like Georgie and Mary goes you like all the boys (laughs) (laughs) she's eight years old oh god yeah she gets slut shamed from being eight hello George Hello, Mary. Hello, Violet. Shoelaces? Please, Georgie. I like him. You like every boy. What's wrong with that? And then when she grows up, she walks past all the men out of the taxi, and then she's wearing that dress, and she's got one of her fabulous hats in, and he's like, gee, Violet, you sure do look swell. She's like, oh, this old thing, and she walks off, and she literally stops traffic. Like traffic stops. Someone hits a someone hits the horn that literally goes awooga, and all of the men are just like looking, like pause, like this, like literally looking up her skirt, and it's like she's just she's just going about her day. You don't forget. Yeah, that's actually a drink on your game and mine because it yeah. rolls us well. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, I did feel like this film had a lot of questionable sexual dynamics going on. So mm-hmm. that was one. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Bailey. Hello, Violet. Hey, you look good. That's some dress you got on there. What? This old thing? Well, I only wear it when I don't care how I look. How would you like to... Yes. This is quite specific, but drink every time George manspreads. (laughs) Did you notice this? I did not. I, mean, I think Jimmy Stewart is quite a tall man, or was quite a tall man. But every time there's a scene where he sits down, his knees are like three feet apart. <laughs> like there's a scene where he's sat on the couch with Mary, and he just, he just sits there and just man spreads, man spreads, and she's literally perched on the end. I was like, what a dick! Like <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why he has to man spread. He may just be incredibly well endowed. That, that's why everyone loves him. Like, you know. There you go. Yeah, that George Bailey's a swell guy. Yeah, mm. the richest guy in town. Yeah. <laughs> No one is poor who has a nine-inch penis. <laughs> also, he's hung like a bear. Yes. <laughs> a bear is well hung, noticeably. Don't know. Do you mean donkey? I just like the term bear for that sentence. I don't feel like I've ever seen a bear's penis. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe they aren't big. Well, not an animal bear. I mean, sorry. <laughs> 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 oh, anyway. Bears. Sorry. Um, anyway. Yeah, but no, because bears, they stand... You see a lot of scenes where bears, like... You know, if you yeah, see a bear right. in a film, it's always like... Front, it's like, it goes, row. I've never been like, oh, that bear has a huge tick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Forget that. Hung like a donkey, I guess. Hung like a donkey. Fair Probably. enough. Probably. Hung like a sperm whale. Mm-hmm. There's like, it's like 12 feet long and prehensile. It can move around. Yeah. 
Uh, and finally, anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are my drinking games. Are we ready for some sequels? Yeah. Who's first? I think I've gone first a lot recently, so maybe you should go first. <gasps> I feel like I go first a lot. Well, I go first if you want. No, I go no, first. If you it's want. fine. No, the I guest don't... always goes in the middle. That's. Oh, oh, okay. Is that? Yeah. I, I clearly I need to listen to this podcast. More. I know. <clears throat> yeah. Come on, Ross. Are you playing it? Okay. So <laughs> for me, I decided for once I'm going to do more of a concept than an actual story. So, okay. Cool. Because I just I just didn't want to do the accent. Oh, I really wanted to hear you do a Jamie Stewart. Like. No, no. I didn't. So instead, I thought, okay, well, if I sort of remade this with a different cast, what cast kind of suits this? Mm-hmm. And then it clicked. Oh, okay. And the name comes with it. So it's called It's a Loony Life. It's a Loony Life. Mm-hmm. Is this what you wrap it? Just Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes in general. Okay, interesting. Okay. That's brilliant. So I was hoping that we could all assign different Looney Tunes characters to people in the film. Okay. So obviously, Bugs Bunny is going to be George Bailey. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, not a million miles away. Yeah, Babs tall, Bunny is nasal. Mary, of course. Pardon? Mary is Babs Bunny. Yeah. What about Daffy Duck? What's what's George Bailey's brother. little brother? Harry, Harry Bailey. Harry, but Harry. Why should I? Why did I forget the name Harry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That's <clears throat> Daffy Duck. That works. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I guess. Elmer Fudd. Ooh, oh, Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter. Unless you've got another villain to play. Um... I think he's Mr. Potter. Uh, unless you want to do Porky, Porky Pig as Mr. Potter. No, nah, Porky Pig's a nice guy. Yeah, Porky Pig's a okay, villain. Okay, okay, sure. Um, Porky Pig's a bit more incompetent uncle who loses money all the time. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Marvin the Martian. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's got to be Clarence. Oh, Clarence. Oh, yeah. oh, God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be. Surely. How many Animaniacs are there? Could they be the kids? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Are there only three? There's three animated there? but there's nah. four, um, four, chi- four, four children. And to be fair, the children were... You could you could lose one. You could one of them was, was in bed the whole time anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is true. <laughs> Zuzu. Yeah. The one who already sounds like an animaniac. Yeah. Who's Roadrunner? Ooh. Who is Roadrunner? Violet, maybe? Oh, yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's chasing her. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. <laughs> well, this one kind of... It's this similar. Speedy Gonzalez? Oh, uh, Speedy Gonzalez is the token foreign person, Ooh. Martini. Yes, yes, that's true. He's the token foreign person. Yeah, that yeah. fits really well. So that's Speedy mm-hmm. Gonzalez. Mm-hmm. Um, Sylvester? The bartender. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's grumpy. I like R- it, yeah. Great, okay, well, who's Sylvester's Tweety Pie? Oh. Tweety Tweety. 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 Maybe, well, maybe Tweety Pie is the raven. Yes! Ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Nice. Good yeah. one, good one. I taught, I taught unsecured loans. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay, this might be difficult. What about a Tasmanian devil? Um, I feel like a lot of these characters are typified by moving around very fast a lot. Mm. And no one in It's a Wonderful Life moves very fast at all. Could the Tasmanian devil be the guy who opens the swimming pool? Could be. I was thinking it might be the guy who... The guy who runs the chemist slash ice cream store. Somebody explain that to me. Who um, <laughs> who keeps poison on the desk? Yeah, yeah. Ice Whose cream. son dies, and so he gets really, really sad, and he nearly poisons somebody. Well, for him, I was thinking Yosemite Sam was going to be that okay. Character. Oh, that's true. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Tasmanian Devil. Ma- yeah, maybe the pool boy then. I guess. Yeah, yeah, the mischievous person who opens the pool up. Yeah, yeah. I guess that is. You combine he's... the two characters: the yeah. one with the key and the one who did mm-hmm. the push. Yeah, he's an agent of chaos. So, yeah. yeah. Right. And my final one of the characters I've remembered at Looney Tunes, Wile E. Coyote. Oh, see, that would kind of be... Oh, who's the possible. guy who ended up in plastics, who'd been chasing Violet oh, and ended up with someone else? Oh, Sam, yeah. Sam? Yeah, because yeah. he chased Violet for a bit, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, he chased or, Mary. No, he chased Mary. Yeah, I mean, everyone was chasing Violet, but... Um... That is true. <laughs> yeah. That's all I've got for It's a Looney Life. Okay. But alternatively, it could be It's a Muppet Life. Oh, okay, I like that better. Because I like, I Cause do you that, prefer the Muppets. I do. Like I love that. the Muppets, and I feel like the Muppets have. I'm going to do a little Muppet rant. Um, oh dear! Because the Muppets rebranded a few years ago. They had the film out that was really successful. It was great. You know, they, they went really meta. And um, did you ever watch the Muppet movie? Uh, no. About eight years ago, it came out. So good, loved it. But then they did a sequel. I watched the Muppet Christmas Carol, the greatest Christmas movie. Yeah. But that's something from about a thousand years ago. Yeah. So they did this rebrand where they just kind of went meta and rebranded the Muppets entirely, and then they just did a sequel that was kind of the same but a bit less good. And then the Muppets went away again. Whereas I think they should have jumped straight from that to doing what they do best, which is Muppets in Cl- classic Cl- literature instead of yeah, yeah. Like Muppet Treasure Island, amazing. Muppet Christmas Carol, amazing. Yeah. Muppet Avengers. Muppet That'd Avengers. See, the, the, the time is so right. Yeah. So it's a Muppet wonderful life. I'm on board. So clearly Kermit is George. There's no debate. It has to be, yeah. yeah. Miss Piggy is Mary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like it. Oh, Beaker, the science guy. He could be the uh, druggist. I feel like he's Uncle Billy because Beaker is insane. Oh, that's he's just point. like he's like got the money in his hands. He's like, Mimu, 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 
<laughs> then the money's gone. It's like yeah, okay, I, I like that. That's what, the only other Muppet I know. Yeah. While, while we're somewhat on topic with Muppets here, did you guys notice the two cops called Bert and Ernie? Yes. yes. <laughs> Everything <laughs> came from this film. Yeah. What was that about? Also, it even carried on the whole Bert and Ernie are gay thing because there's a point where Bert kisses Ernie, and then he's <laughs> like, "No, I'm not into it, mate." Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. One of them was very into that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I think Dr. Bunsen Honeydew can play the chemist because he is. Oh, the, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, oh. What's the guy who lives in a trash can? Oscar the Grouch. Oscar the Well, that's technically that's Sesame Potter. Street, but close enough. That's Potter. I guess he's grouchy enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Os- yeah okay, fair enough. Oscar the Grouch can be. Hang on. Is Sesame Street not the Muppets? They are Jim Henson, but and they have crossed over, but they're two separate shows. Wait, Oscar I the don't Grouch think isn't... I can join in with this because I only know Sesame Street characters. Oscar now. the Grouch is not in Muppet movies. Actually, he did cameo in one, I think, but he's not like a. Right, then I can't join in until we're done talking about Muppets because I don't know Okay, anymore. so it's a Sesame Street life we'll get to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Oscar the Grouch does work. I'm trying to think, there aren't many, many other like evil Muppets. Most Muppets are kind of benign. So and He's not evil, but he's grouchy. So He can make a cameo, I guess. Can, can Bert and Ernie play Bert and Ernie the police? Oh, 100%. Um, yeah, yeah, they uh, have to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what about um, Statler and Waldorf? Ooh. Who do they play? See, now they could be possible. Which of those two? Are they the... The old man who... Heckle. Thing. Heckle, yeah. yeah. Between them, they could be Potter. They, yeah, they, they could, could have two Potters, yeah. Yeah, that mm-hmm. could work. Because in um, Muppet Christmas Carol, they're Marley and Marley. Ooh. Oh, uh, that's true. They're yeah. Marley's ghosts, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's good. That yeah. Work. But I feel like... Well, there are only two female Muppets and Humans Piggies, so obviously Violet's going to be Janet. Janet is the Muppet in the band who was like, Hey, man. No, really? With the big lips, yeah. You know oh, the one. She's blonde. She plays the drums, I think, right? Uh, no. No? Okay, fine. I thought Animal plays the drums. Oh, Animal does play the drums. She plays the guitar, though. Yeah. Ah. We need to use Gonzo somewhere. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know what his character is like. Gonzo is kind of crazy, and like he has sex with chickens. Does <laughs> <laughs> that come up in children's movies much? Yeah, well, he's married to Camilla. His, his, his great love is Could he Camilla be the, the chicken. Um, ah. I, forgot, I forgot his name, but the barman at the end. Nick. He could be Nick, Nick yeah. Would that work? Okay, yeah, and Rizzo can be the other barman then, because they always have to be together, Gonzo and Rizzo. Oh, yeah. Rizzo the rat, so. Great, yeah. Cool. There you go. Uh, it's a Muppet life. Cast. Yeah. Done. I like it, yeah. Oh, we need Fozzie Bear. Have we cast Harry yet? Clarence. Clarence could be Fozzie the Bear, mm-hmm. yeah, because he's, yeah. he's got the mind of a child. There you go. Yeah, Fozzie Bear, Clarence. Like mm-hmm. it. Cool. Done. Okay, now, it's a Firefly life. Oh, All the characters from Firefly. <laughs> it's, it's a, a Buffy a... the Vampire Slayer life. That's exactly where I was going to go next. <laughs> It's a Sex in the City life. No, let's stop this. Okay. I can't help it that <laughs> No. It's an Avengers life. There's so many. It's a Harry Potter life. It's a Doctor Who life. It's a Star Trek life. It's... Okay, moving on moving to another okay. idea. Then. Okay, so are, are, are you done, Harry? Is that... Yeah, oh, I'm done. Okay. okay, cool. <laughs> Ross, hit us with Okay, simple. my idea is it's a wonderful war. It's a wonderful war. Not, oh, what a lovely war, which is a film in itself. But... <laughs> no, it's a wonderful war. It's going to be directed by Christopher Nolan. Okay. And it is going to be in the style of Dunkirk. A mm. uh, film I saw recently and really enjoyed. Now I want another one. Interesting uh, style of being like filmed in three sort of time streams. Um, we'll get to that. Yeah. I don't know if that's how it would work or not. Probably not. But more in the style of Dunkirk in terms of just like close up, actiony, small groups of people kind of thing. Not, sure. Not big scale war, but kind of sort of focused on the people. Yeah. And it follows Harry Bailey, of course. Um, and so it's a side quill. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, what Harry Bailey was doing. Exactly. Mm. So we see Harry Bailey at home, doing his hometown life and stuff. Mm-hmm. And we see him fall in the ice and be saved, but from his perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we see clues throughout as to how George is affecting his life as well. Uh, and we see like the homecoming dance. We see what he's up to and who he's trying to seduce at the homecoming dance. Mm-hmm. And then the pool opens up, but he doesn't fall in or something. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, you know, it's all seen from different perspectives. Maybe he gives a key to somebody. To play a prank on somebody else. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, it, I like it. Uh, it. Tangential links come in. Okay. Uh, it is a little bit based on the Back to the Future 2 idea of things layering on top. Mm-hmm. The way Back to the Future layers on top of one. And then we see him doing army training and making some friends and meeting some buddies and stuff who then end up separating. And maybe this is where you do the Dunkirk multiple tracks story. The people he met in training all go into different areas. Mm-hmm. But then everybody ends up on or around that ship transport. Mm-hmm. at the end and he then saves the transport mm-hmm. and everybody is fine and that's where he gets the heroic thing and then we have a dramatic scene where he gets his medal and stuff and then he comes back home oh also we'll have scenes throughout the wartime stuff going back to new bedford and see what george is doing because that was a very brief bit in it's a wonderful life but in it's a wonderful war we can see george for a bit more detail as an air raid warden and getting harry's letters and Seeing how he gets, uh, like, does metal drive and rubber drive stuff. Well, maybe we could have Harry receiving George's letters. 
That too. So we have what's going on in George's life told through letters there. We don't Ooh, necessarily need point. to see it. That's a good point. Or you could have it like the smash cuts between like Harry and his fighter jet being like, Ippie K.A. motherfuckers, like blowing up German <laughs> yeah. planes. Like, and it cuts to George's like sat in that boring Bale and Bonds yeah. place, just like, you know, <laughs> yeah. elevator music, like writing out his checks. Just like, mm, yeah. yeah. Raven's That's true. Done, well, Raven's done fact, a poo on the Raven counter. shits on his shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you would re- you'd recast it so they look similar, mm-hmm. so that they look more similar to each other than they did in the previous one. And okay. then you can fade it from one to the other. Mm. And he's at home being an air raid warden. Mm-hmm. And then it goes back to Harry, who's now in a plane. So you get that interesting dynamic between yeah. the two of them. But yeah, and then so it ends with the big final dramatic scene is him shooting down the planes the, above the transport, which is basically one of the scenes in Dunkirk anyway with Tom Hardy. Mm-hmm. And he saves the transport and we get a big Star Wars style medal ceremony. Mm-hmm. And then he goes back home to New Bedford and we get a very short version of the story. What about the girl he met and got married? Oh, good point. There's a whole plot line there. Yeah. How he meets her. <laughs> mm. I'd forgotten about that. I'd forgotten he comes home with a wife. Yeah. That's before he went to war though. I thought it was after. Yeah, he, I think. No, he goes to war and on, way, on his way back, because when he comes back from war, he comes back with a wife. Yeah, just like... Is it that way around? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, couldn't remember where he comes back with a wife. But yeah, definitely we could have a story of how he meets his wife. Brilliant. Yeah. There's a whole story there too. Now, I imagine that Chris Nolan being Chris Nolan, he would probably film this on cameras from the 40s or whenever it was when the light came out. Mm-hmm. So this film would look, I reckon, pretty sort of to date of the 40s. Yeah, that could work even better. I'd um, really love to see that. And yeah, I'd, and I'd love to see any anybody try and make a film, but with old technology, so that it looks old. Yeah. Also, being Chris Nolan, there's got to be some kind of gimmick in it that's going to make it really hard to follow. Yeah. Well, they could be told entirely through letters or something. Yeah. Like Harry writes letters to George, and George pieces the story together by reading mm. the letters. Yeah. Something so it's like just a, it's a blog. There's some kind of ta- <laughs> there's some kind of multiple timeline thing going on that you yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, this is the aspect that could work with that i was wondering about weaving in sections which might be real but might not be real whether or not george exists or not okay if george exists in this universe it's one kind of story the story is slightly different if this is the universe where george doesn't exist and there are subtle visual clues as to which universe we're in i like, like that a color a lot. palette that's, or something. that's really good i love that and yeah. so we see the same event from different places but problem is harry would be dead from like age eight in one of the universes. So we might have to retcon the u- which universe is which. Yeah. Or which parts well, of George Bailey's life. Could be, could be, could be following to. different characters in this war. Oh, that's a point. Someone mm. other than Harry yeah. could be... So in one universe, Harry exists and saves the transport. And in the alternate universe... This other guy's just really trying. Other people. Like, oh, no, I keep... Oh, no, they've, they've all died. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Whole way and we cut between those two. One with Harry in, one not with Harry in. There we Brilliant. go. There you go. That makes it really hard to follow. Mm-hmm. Perfect Christopher Nolan fodder. Let's write a screenplay. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, so that's it. And uh, maybe when he gets home, the two storylines sort of merge together mm-hmm. and we see George decide not to kill himself kind of thing. And we see George happy with life and Harry comes in and they're brothers and, and it has a great ending, a happy ending, in which he's kind of, his brother's like, and it's a wonderful life kind of thing. Aww. I love how I conclude his, and it has a great ending. Yes, which I have not been. <laughs> a, a, happy ending, a happy ending, I mean. A happy ending for everybody. Yes, cool. And Harry exists, mm-hmm. and George didn't kill yeah. himself, and didn't leave yeah. a bunch of widows and orphans behind him. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. That's It's a Wonderful War in the style of Dunkirk. I'll get Christopher Nolan on the phone this afternoon. Fabulous. Uh, okay, so I guess that means it's my turn now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have gone for a direct sequel, which is... Challenging in itself because according to our rules, all of these characters, you know, all the actors are now dead. Yeah. So this is kind of a hard one to do. It's a full recast. Yeah, it's gonna to have to be a full recast. So maybe it's a remake maybe it's a remake and then what I'm pitching is the sequel to the remake. Okay. Or maybe it's just the recast and we just hope hope that everyone who watches understands the original plot of mm-hmm. uh, interesting. Yeah. But this goes back to my question before about okay, so it ends on a happy note where he's been pushed to the brink of suicide and then the whole town rallies, the business is saved. And, you know, it's Christmas and he senses the joy in life again. And then the movie ends. But then what happens the day after? You know, people don't just become suicidal on a whim. You know, that, that suggests, you know, some deep-rooted psychological issues that are going <clears throat> on, which I love to explore. So the first challenge I had was, who is the new James Stewart? Because he's a very distinctive kind of movie star type. He's, he's the classic all-American Every man. And in all of his movies, have you ever seen any, any other James Stewart movies? He's in the Philadelphia story. He's in a bunch of Hitchcock things. And he always plays this very kind of like idealised American, you know, mm. boy done good kind of, you know. So... I've got an idea for it, but you're not going to like it. Okay. Matt Damon? 
Maybe, but he's a bit... I don't know if Matt Damon's that kind of aspirational. Mm. He's more, like, blandly likeable. I feel like James Stewart's more like... My thought was Tom Hanks, but younger. Yeah, that crossed my mind too, but yeah. so what, you're going to de-age Tom Hanks? I don't know, because I feel like Tom Hanks has that quality, but he's 69, mm. and I'm, this isn't supposed to be, like, 30 years on. So, I couldn't think of anyone else who had what James Stewart has, because I think it's a very of its time kind of thing. To be fair, Tom Hanks can play younger than he is. Yeah, like sure. If you look at, uh, uh, what was it called? The, what, the... Big? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, the, the sequel to Da Vinci Code that came out recently. Uh, oh, in, in yeah. Inferno. I did not watch that film. Okay. Uh, it, it wasn't good, but given that came out the same year as Sully, in which he's playing much older oh, okay. than, than I think he is, yeah, it worked well. So okay. yeah, I reckon he could do it. Do okay. He's got range then. Oh yeah, some, well, Tom Hanks would be ideal as, a, as an actor, it's just the fact that he's too old. So I went away from that because I couldn't think of anyone younger than Tom Hanks who has that particular all-American quality. And so I just went with visually, like who looks like Jimmy Stewart, and I felt like Joseph Gordon-Levitt kind of looks like him. Oh, good shout! Yeah, he hasn't yeah. Much recently. Yeah, and he, I think from certain angles he looks a lot like Jimmy Stewart, mm. and he's quite actory, so he could probably do that accent like, quite well. Right? In that he is an actor. But I mean, but he, he's, he's not just an actor though; he's an actor. Yeah, he likes to do stuff. He likes he likes an accent. He likes to like you know do things. Yeah. Have you ever heard his really hammy French accent in the is it the Tightrope Walker? Oh, no, um, I why. Man on a wire, yeah. yeah. I've not seen it, though. He is so French in that you cannot stand it. Why? That is the question people ask me most. Pourquoi? Why? For what? Why do you walk on the wire? Why do you tempt fate? Why do you risk death? But I don't think of it this way. I never even say this word. Death. La mort. So, yes, yeah, so him. And for the wife, for the Donna Reed role, mm-hmm. Mary, I was kind of thinking... Who's an actress who's like really boring and only ever gets stuck playing the girlfriend? But then, because they're so inherently boring, I really struggle to think of any. So then I thought maybe Kate Hudson. It feels like she only ever plays. I have no like, idea who she is. So perfect. Goldie Hawn's daughter. She was in Almost Famous. She's been in a lot of really. Sounds like she rom-coms. was Almost Famous. Yeah, she's been in a lot of really ropey rom coms with like Matthew McConaughey and Luke Wilson and. Oh Owen Wilson yeah, and, now I think I know who you mean. She's blonde. Yeah. She's blonde. Yes. Yeah. She's exactly. She's just very. She's, she's, she's bland. Or Jennifer Garner. I can think of. Her or Jennifer Garner. A, G- a Jennifer or a Kate. You know, one of those actors. <laughs> Jennifer or a Kate. Jennifer Garner or, or Jessica Biel. Someone, oh, someone Jessica Biel would work. Someone in the JTK range. If it, that feels like the, the girlfriend zone. Like. Uh, yeah. So who, Who's the Jennifer who's in A Beautiful Mind? Jennifer Connolly. Oh my God, there's so many. She could work. There you go. She could work. Yeah. A Jennifer or a Kate or a Jessica. Someone in the JTK range. She's done this by alphabet and it's worked really well. It is, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, once you get past that, you get to some real quality acting, but JK is a boring, yeah. Or oh, the Julia Moore's great. Yeah, because then straight after that, it's Laurence Olivier. Yeah, exactly. And after that, it's Meryl Streep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... And Let's stop, go through the whole album. Stop, stop there, stop there. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to do our album. Al- with story. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I thought maybe Kate Hudson or Jessica Biel or Jessica Alba. Jessica Alba. Oh my, oh my God, there's so many of these girls. <laughs> They're all called Jessica or Jennifer. So either that, or maybe, based on where this is going, as a bit of a spoiler, maybe have Rosamund Pike from Gone Girl. Oh, interesting. Someone, good. someone who has the look, but also has the sinisterness. So mm. is she playing... Uh... She's playing Mary, yeah, the Donna yeah. Reed role. Okay. So yeah, so they're the central couple. So, and it does take place in the immediate aftermath of the original film. So Christmas has passed. In fact, the first day of this film, I imagine, is the 2nd of January. Okay. The most depressing day of the year. Yeah. So now, you know, the Christmas season's passed. And now, now what? He's back to this job. He literally hates this town. He did say that repeatedly, <laughs> that he hates being there and he mm-hmm. feels like really cramped down by the town. So, and he's obviously dealing with these deep-rooted issues that he's been suppressing for years that have led him to just contemplate suicide because he had a bad day. A very bad day, but still not a great day. So he goes back to the office and continues to work in this kind of soul-crushing financial job that he doesn't feel very passionate about in this kind of one-horse town that he now mm-hmm. knows he will never escape. Mm-hmm. But that he finds that despite this kind of temporary reprieve and this temporary kind of reaffirmation of the good of humanity kind of thing, he still can't push these feelings of kind of misery and claustrophobia out of his mind. Mm-hmm. So he thinks, you know what? This time I'm really going to do it. I'm going to take that holiday. It's really going to happen this time. So it goes to Mary and he's like, Mary, we've had a rough year let's just take the kids and let's go away somewhere exciting. Let's mm-hmm. go to New York. Let's go to, to Italy. Let's go, let's go travel. You know, let's live life, embrace it. And Mary kind of shoots him down. She's like, we can't possibly travel now, George. That's madness. Uh, Uncle Billy's still very fragile. Clearly he's not in any condition to run the place on his own. And uh, we owe money to the whole town now. Because they end up all giving him cash, you know. Mm-hmm. So she's like, no, no, no. It's just not feasible to go traveling, George. Just, just, just be happy with what you've got. So he's like, 
bargaining. He's like, well, what if I train someone up to run Bailey Brothers while we're gone and then I'll repay all of our debts and then can we go on holiday? And she's like, well, maybe, but that'll take years. So, so he continues to feel very, very trapped. He does take on a trainee though and he, he starts putting money away on the side without telling Mary. Mm-hmm. Like, in addition to the money he's, he's earning, he's putting like 20% of his pay every month. He's squibbling it away for, for his dream holiday fund. Yeah. And in fact, he really starts to resent Mary at this point for kind of constantly crushing his dreams and kind of trapping him. And his relationship with her deteriorates to the point where his kind of alcoholism returns. He starts drinking very heavily, mm-hmm. being quite abusive to the children. And he even starts having an affair with Violet. Ooh. Oh. Mm, yeah. Good story. The only other woman in town. Yeah, indeed. Because I did wonder at that point in the film, how do you think Mary would feel about him giving money to a random woman? <laughs> Because there's that whole thing where he's like giving her money to go travelling to New York and stuff and it's like, I'll pay you back, oh, don't be silly. And then at the end she's like, oh, I didn't. I decided not to go. I'm like, alright, Violet, I guess you're doing something. Yeah, I felt like that was an interesting little plot line that they left hanging. So yeah, so he starts having an affair with Violet. Who again, casting for Violet? I thought Margot Robbie, maybe? Oh yeah, that's a good choice. I'll take Margot Robbie. Yeah. Or if you want to be really funny with it, Kate McKinnon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, that, she's good would, with, that would work. She's good with hats. Um, yeah. <laughs> she is good with hats. Yeah. So he starts having an affair with Violet. Uh, and after a while, with his marriage kind of essentially reduced to this loveless charade, he proposes to Violet that the two of them should run away together to New York like she wanted to do. She's like, leave your wife and children? George, you can't. And he's like, look, I know it's not great, but you know, I'll send money back to them. And at the end of the day, if I don't get out of this town soon, I'm going to go insane. I'm going to attempt I'm suicide. I'm going to go ahead and kill myself. Yeah, and that's not going to be good for the Mipers. So, you know, it, it's... Oh, by the way, I did try that once. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the lesser of two evils, so... Come away with me. Let's let's go and escape this town. But then she's she's adamant. She's like George. You, know, you don't understand. You can't leave. And he's like, what do you, what do you mean? And then she kind of gets very upset. And then she hugs him close. And she whispers into his ears, they won't let you. And then suddenly an ambulance pulls up. And two drivers jump out, run up, grab Violet. Oh my god! Section it's, her. It's a Truman and, Show. Oh, you spoiled it now. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so they true they like that scene in hey, the Truman Show. Hey, you did show. that last week. I did do the Truman Show last week. Kind of did. did. What did I do last week? The Shining? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's so awesome. <laughs> the whole thing was a TV show. Oh, I have done this twice. Haven't I? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, I'm slightly repeating myself. It was so obvious, though. It was so obvious. Like, That's why you can't leave Bedford Falls. Have yeah. we been calling it New Bedford? I, I think I've been calling it New Bedford. No, I have. It's just Bedford Falls. Yeah, my Bedford fault. Falls. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, like that scene in The Truman Show where Natasha McAlone's character gets t- literally dragged away and she's screaming. And mm-hmm. it's like, uh, so, basically, that is happening. She gets dragged away screaming, like, you're trapped, it's a trap. And they say, no, she's gone nuts, she's gone crazy, it's all right, George. So, yeah, the ambulance takes her away. And then he's like, fuck this, I'm out of here. Like, this is crazy. So he runs up to the taxi driver from the original film. He's like, what was that guy's name? I didn't want to know. Ernie. Ernie? Wasn't it? Was it Ernie? I think it was, he was either Bert or Ernie. Yeah, it was one of the two. Okay, so Bert or Ernie, take me to the airport. I'm blowing this popsicle stand. And he's like, oh, sorry, George, there's roadblocks all around town. I mean, there's, I did, there's no way out. And so eventually George freaks out, steals a car, starts driving out of town. I feel like the, the, the momentum has gone now that you've picked up what this is. But I, I should have <laughs> predicted this. It's all right. I should have predicted it. It's, it's pretty obvious from that point what's going on. But <laughs> um, yeah, so he's driving out of town. And then obviously there's constantly people trying to hem him in, hem him in, hem him in. Mm-hmm. And one thing leads to another. We'll fast forward to through some plot. Maybe gets on a boat and sails out like the Truman Show kind of thing. And yeah, we have, we ultimately realise that what has happened is... Because I've done the... I have visited the Truman Show a few times on this show. Uh, last last time I explicitly referenced it was... Oh, for the Truman Show episode that we did. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> where they did sequels. They did The Hunger Games. Yeah, and that yeah. didn't work. So this is actually the next iteration of the show. Oh, God. So the novelty's kind of worn off just watching people in the real world. Yeah. And the whole Hunger Games thing, there was too much of a liability. Like, we've so they're recreating old Americana. So yeah, so now it's like the Truman Show retro edition where they've kidnapped this child and raised them in a perfect recreation of the 1940s. Oh. And everyone but him is an actor. Oh, my God, that's yeah. brilliant. Mm. Mm. And even the kids are like child actors. Like, I think that's really funny. Child actors are then gro- So Harry Bailey... Mm. Is he, is he actually George Bailey's brother? No, no, they're all actors. Everyone's an actor. Okay, so... And Mary presumably never became actually pregnant. No, 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 no. Yeah, maybe Mary was a cyborg. Maybe she, like... Maybe <laughs> she's, like, a sexual... Is that Westworld? <laughs> I was trying to think, like, how could she have babies but not... Like, she, he'd have to have sex with her. But she could be impregnated by her actual husband in real life. Yeah. So, but... yeah. So either she's having babies on demand, or she's signed a contract, or she's a cyborg, a sex bot... Who of they just kind. yeah, and then they just draft in child actors. And Although it's the nineteen, it's the nineteen forties. During that time, the dad would be on, 
unlikely to literally be present at the actual birth. Probably. True, That's exactly. a lot more of a mod- modern thing. So they could presumably fake it. Yeah. I think when this happens, we should get a lot of flashbacks to scenes from the original film yeah. or recreations of the original film where uh, we see how it's all been a TV show, it's all been a facade. So uh, yeah, at the birth of the baby, it's like you need to get step outside, sir, and then we see them all like change the set and like bring on the baby that they just bought. And, oh, like, that's brilliant. <laughs> yes, that's so good. Uh, what other scenes from the original film maybe could we have? Like, well, when he, when he falls when he, into the ice. Yeah. What could happen there? Like that water's still got to be freezing cold so much so that George loses his hearing. Maybe he doesn't lose his hearing from the ice. That's just mm. a plot development. He, but, go, he goes under surgery and they just like disable his ear oh well, that's good well there's the scene in the original where Clarence gives him the hearing back briefly in both of his ears so I feel like yeah I feel like the deafness in one ear is definitely a facade like someone they put an implant in him mm-hmm. to uh, block the hearing that's interesting uh, and when he has his own children as well maybe like overnight we'll see them like changing the child actors so like he's like my child looks different today no it's the same kid like, <laughs> <laughs> that's good yeah, and, yeah I, any scene where he tries to leave mm-hmm. certainly and so someone runs in and steals his money or... Quick, run to the yeah. bank! Or like yeah. they organise uh, the crisis in the bank. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. all of this, this is basically inspired by the fact that it really felt like everything that happened was to keep him in this town. And it did mm. feel very Truman Show. I imagine the Truman Show was inspired by this, like Back to the Future. There's yeah. lots of parallels. Again, because it came down to my finding, I found Mary untrustworthy because she reminded me so much of Laura Linney in the Truman yeah. Show. Yeah. She had that perfect hair that never moved, and um, oh, yeah. you know she was always so supportive, and so you know all, uh-huh. all, all she so needed. So long as he never tried to leave. Exactly, exactly. She's always like, you know, well, well I dream that you stay forever. It was just all I needed was for it to turn to the camera and go, try this new Mococo drink, like, <laughs> <laughs> which would also be a good thing to work in because there's a lot of Pepsi in this film. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you could bring that in a lot more and have Mary like promoting the Pepsi. Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua. No artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? So, yeah, that's my idea. And it's obviously called The Bailey Show. The Bailey Show. The Bailey Show. The the Bailey Show, yeah. Not The Baby Show. (laughs) Baby Show. They did steal him as a baby. It does involve a lot of baby theft. I see what you mean. The the Bailey Show. Yeah. I like that. Mm. And so maybe it ends like the Truman Show with him like finally escaping, but he's so lost in this new world because he's literally been raised 40, 50, 60 oh, years. Oh, God, now. yeah, of course. If that's not the, more. So. That's significantly more different yeah. than the Truman Show. So it's left it very hanging. Like, How is he going to adapt to this modern world? Maybe maybe we can see him walking like down a freeway with cars flying past in either direction. He's just completely bewildered. And that's super shot from 28 days later, but with cars. Mm, yeah. People are taking pictures of him on their Yeah, because he's and... super famous. Yeah, oh, my it's, God, of course he would be. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So that I'd is watch that. Show. Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, crikey. Um, <laughs> that's it then? Yeah, so listener submissions? Oh, God, yeah, I nearly forgot. <laughs> it's the highlight of every chapter. I it? know! Okay, it's so we have... almost as good as having a guest on. <laughs> uh, so we have a few. Oh No Lip Class, at Oh No Lip Class Pod. Their idea is a 2017 sequel based around George's grandson, who's an aimless slacker 30-something, probably in the James Franco, Seth Rogen range, <laughs> I imagine, who's also called George who also has an existential Christmas crisis, but instead of Clarence, he gets a smoking, drinking, swearing angel played by Russell Brand. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sounds good. Who's, again, like Clarence, is on his last chance to save someone. It's like mm-hmm. one shot left. And they have lots of kind of wacky misadventures, and Clarence teaches George how to enjoy life, and, you know, but they get it's, it's a lot more rock and roll. Like they get high together and all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. um, this Russell Brand Clarence ends up leading George astray. Because he's just t- telling him to like get high and drink and all that kind of stuff, and then that George actually realizes that not Clarence is causing the malaise in his life by encouraging him to be this big slacker. So then George becomes a real adult and demonstrates this to the people in his life, and gets the girl in time for Christmas. And then not Clarence claims that was his plan all along, and the soundtrack is going to be terrible pop covers of Christmas songs, and it's going to make a zillion dollars. <laughs> so I think the idea is just a bad remake of this film. Is yeah. essentially what we're going with here. Like mm-hmm. if this film was remade in 2017, yeah, it would be Russell Brand. It would be obnoxious. It would It'd be, be bad. Yeah, and it would make money. Yeah, I right, make a bazillion pounds. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Why am I watching this? W A I W T cast. Their idea is George travels back in time to save Sarah Connor and ensure the leader of the resistance will be born. <laughs> I feel like we get that every week. <laughs> is it from the same people? Yeah, they, yeah, they like that a lot. They like, they like a Sarah Connor. I don't know how George is time travelling now, but like, whatever. Maybe Clarence should Clarence go takes him back in time. Maybe Clarence should be saving Sarah Connor. Mm. That oh, that's what that, that right yeah. well. Uh, Blokebusters at Blokebusters no title again George gets old and bitter knowing that angels exist but nobody believes him so, oh god yeah that's good uh, he, becomes a, that. yeah, he becomes a miser and ends up going into the banking industry proper 
and eventually becomes everything he always hated and becomes the most hated man in town because he becomes this miserly Potter-esque banker uh-huh. who's just filled with resentment and loathing. Ooh, ooh, could he have a time travel crisis happen and goes back in time and is Potter? Maybe. From that's the, the original film, it's him and it was him all along. Could that? That's I like that. That's not what they, these guys have done. Their idea is that he becomes this like hateful Mr. Potter figure and then in the autumn of his years, on Christmas, he's visited by three ghosts. And then... <laughs> It's a, Christmas it's, a, it's, a Christmas, it's a Wonderful Life Christmas Carol. It all comes together. It's a Wonderful Christmas Carol. <laughs> it's a Wonderful Christmas Carol. Perfect. See, these titles aren't hard, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Easy Rider Raging Podcast. E-R-R-P cast. E-R-R Podcast. Sorry, I, ne- I could never pronounce that. So in this version, it's a Henry Potter origin story. Ooh. And a Mr. Potter origin story. And it starts with him as a young man. And he's actually a very nice guy. He's just a nice, generous, good person. You know, very social. But over the years, he meets two devils who whisper in his ears and tell him how to do all these bad things. Uh, and it turns him into an evil motherfucker. So, you know, the, the, the character we see in the, this bit embittered, cynical, money-grabbing guy we see in the films mm-hmm. is because basically some devil versions of Clarence have got the grips into him and turned him into this money-grabber. And then so we cut to the end of A Wonderful Life, It's a Wonderful Life, where George gets all his money from his friends and is all happy. And we see the ending we didn't see is that Clarence actually takes Mr. Potter out of a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then turns to Cameron and goes, now that's a wonderful death. <laughs> and that's the title of that film is It's a Wonderful Death <laughs> so I guess it's kind of Frank Capra meets the Punisher kind of style I don't know yeah brilliant yeah Captain Hygiene it's at CPT underscore hygiene his idea is one to a full life Potter's Revenge so it's D-O-N two oh yeah full so the, the I guess fast it's, and the it's the Fast and the Furious style. style yeah his idea is that again Mr. Potter tormented by visions of other lives begins recruiting dreamers to erase George from existence. So, is that Inception or Dreamers? Yeah. Minority Report? It's one of those. Uh, he recruits dreamers to erase George from existence. And as the Potterverse begins to consume all realities, George needs to find a way to stop Potter, even if it means losing everything he loves. So, mm-hmm. some kind of high concept sci-fi take. Yeah. Does Doctor Who turn up in this one? They didn't say so, but they didn't say he doesn't either. So. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, Paper Chain Podcast, also gone with some numerical titles. So there's his Too Wonderful to Life. <laughs> and uh, 20 years after the events of the original George Bailey is whisked off to a dark possible future by Clarence after his daughter Zuzu is arrested for robbing the building alone <laughs> so, nice so yeah I like that Zuzu turns out to be a wrong one and I was just going to go too sickly sweet she's only got one scene in the whole movie she's got two she's in the bed of the rose and then she's the one who says look daddy they say when ever a bell rings an angel gets its wings oh that's right look daddy teacher says every time a bell Angel gets his wings. Yeah, that, that's her entire role. Basically, yeah. What do you want from her? She's seven, right? <laughs> Good point. They use their child actors sparingly. Yes, which from what we do see of them, I appreciate. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, so there's our ideas for this week. So thank you guys for all of those. Very, very good. If you have a sequel idea for It's a Wonderful Life or for any other films we've done in the past or any films you'd like to hear us do in the future, please get in touch with us. We are Beyond the Box Set. You can find us on all good podcasting platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Podbean, Player FM, Google Play, The Works. You can also get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Google+, wherever you want to find us, basically just search Beyond the Box Set. We will come up and yeah, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. If you like the show, hit subscribe for a new episode every Friday morning. And if you really like the show, leave us a review because it makes us feel good and it helps other people to find us. Hmm. And next week, it is my turn to make a film, I believe. Oh dear. Yep. We're continuing the Christmas theme for the next few weeks. Uh-huh. So next week I'm getting to choose a Christmas film. And I'm choosing a, a classic absolutely on a par with It's a Wonderful Life. Mm-hmm. So I am choosing a little film called Krampus. I've not heard of this film. It's a film that came out in 2015, stars Adam Scott and Tony Collette. And okay. it is a film about the mythical, I think German or Austrian, Christmas Goblin. Christmas yep. I'm vaguely familiar yeah, with the concept who, ki- of Who Krampus. kidnaps naughty children. It's like a very dark Christmas story in, on mainland Europe. If you're a bad child, you don't just not get presents from Santa. If you're a bad child, a demon will come into your bedroom at night and eat you. Okay. And that is Krampus. And then we had a horror movie out of it in 2015. Okay, so I'm predicting the Krampus show. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the Krampus has been a reality show this whole time. Right, I'm going to have to cancel this and rethink because I've got extensive rewrites to do. So. Oh, all right, well, that's next week then. Yeah. Cool. Looking forward to it? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll see, what, see what happens. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Ross, for coming on. Yes, yeah. thanks, Ross. Well, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's been an excellent day. And uh, yeah, thanks for pushing me to watch It's a Wonderful Life. Or at least, uh, well, thank you for inviting me. So I thought about It's a Wonderful Life yeah. the first time <laughs> in ever. Because uh, this gave me an excuse to watch it, which I was very happy about. 
So okay. thank you very much, guys. Good. Yeah. Anything you want to plug before we say goodbye? Um, yeah, feel free to check out uh, mine and Harry's other podcast, Two Geeks, Two Movies. We talk about movies in pairs, and we are between us, Two Geeks. So check us out. We're all over Facebook and Twitter and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So just search Two Geeks, Two Movies, and you can find us comparing movies. Uh, I think the first episode of that will be out by the time this is out. Yeah, let's say so. Harry does the scheduling. Now we have a deadline. <laughs> now we've got a deadline. Oh, no. A week on Friday. Good luck. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, well, uh, and yeah, thank you again, guys, for having me on, and thanks for listening, everybody. Thank that's you very much. Cool. Well, I guess that's everything then. So, uh, bye. That's it. See you all next week. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs>